Good morning. How you guys doing today? All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Hey, uh, does anyone here remember the first time that they rode a bike without training wheels? Anybody remember that? It's like one of those moments you kind of remember. Well, man, we had a wonderful thing happen in our household today or this week. Woody learned how to ride a bike without his training wheels. Yeah, yeah. So I got a little video my wife recorded. She actually taught him. Okay, come on, Woody, push off that pedal and then you keep going. You got it, Woody! Woody, you got it! Look at him go. <laughs> you missed the screen. Get out of the way! <laughs> But uh, he did, uh, did a great job. You know, my wife actually did it. She trained him how to do it, and uh, he's awesome now. Of course, once he, you learn, now they just want to bike all the time. And he's only four years old. And I honestly, uh, I don't know if everyone remembers when they learned how to bike. Uh, since we moved from the Miami area to here, they've been much more uh, desiring to ride their bikes on the street. So they learned a lot quicker. They didn't even know until we moved here to the Cape. But uh, the first time I learned to ride a bike, I was almost eight years old. I know it sounds a little bit late in life, but it just kind of circumstance had brought me to that, to that situation. And, and part of it was my own fault because um, my grandmother came to me one day and she said, John, I want to buy you a brand new bike. It wasn't even my birthday. And I was like, are you kidding me? And I was one of three brothers. Well, there's five of us all together, but I grew up with the two and I was the third in line. And so I rarely got anything new. If it was clothes, it was hand-me-downs. If it was shoes, it was hand-me-downs. Even a bike, I was expecting, because my brother was going to outgrow his bike. We're all boys, right? He's going to get a nice new bike, and I'm gonna, if they're going to get passed down, I'm going to get the next bike. So I was always excited to get the next thing. But when she said that, I mean, I was elated. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to get something brand new only for me. And so I said to her, but instead of getting a bike, can you get me a big wheel? Does anybody remember what a big wheel looked like? Some of you, I got a picture of a big wheel up here. That's a big wheel. And I'm eight years old, guys. This is a picture of this. That's me. That's not me, but I mean, you know, that, I wanted this thing. And the reason I wanted this thing right here, and it's all plastic, because I don't think there's hardly any metal, you know, on this thing. And it, it, because my friends had one, and you see the little seat in the back, you'd pull it off, and it doesn't really show it. Maybe it's on the other side. They had that little brake. You ever you remember that little brake? It was like a little metal arm, and you just went, Arr! and it, pushed up against that back wheel. Well, we would take those things and we lived on like a, 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 the house that we lived in had a huge driveway, but it was a giant hill. You had to drive. It was terrible in the winters, okay, getting up and down. But you would have a lot of fun going down this thing on anything that you didn't have to pedal. And so this thing, I, we would stand up and use it more like a scooter, kind of get on it like this and then go like this. And then you'd sit down and you'd pull that little brake and it'd skid out. And then we'd go up jumps with it. And, I used, and I'm like, I want one of those. And she's like, aren't you a little old for that? And I'm like, yeah, but I have so much fun on it. Can you get me a big wheel? So she decides to give in, and she bought me a big wheel. And I couldn't wait till that got here. We got it. It came in a box, and you had to take some, some assembly required, you know. And so I was so excited. I got that thing together, and that day, I played on it all day. I mean, I spun out on it. I did jumps with it. I had a lot of fun, and I just kept going. I was so excited. I went to bed totally happy that night. And I'm just like, man, my life is so good. And then the next day, I woke up, and my friends came by. And I'm like, guys, look, I got this brand new big wheel. Let's go do some jumps. Let's go hang out. Let's have some fun. They're like looking at me really strange. And they're like, no, um, we're going to go on our bikes, okay? So we're just going to take off now. And I'm like, oh, oh, oh wait, wait, wait. Let's, uh, you don't want to play with this? They're like, no, no, no. We're going to go bike, and then we're going to go hang out. And then I'm like, okay, um, all right. And so I tried to keep up with my little big wheel. <laughs> I'm like this. <laughs> and as they start disappearing into the horizon, I realized I made a really bad mistake. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my gosh. What was I thinking? And why did my grandmother let me do this? So I own a big wheel. And, then, and, and you know, um, I just was thinking, like, man, there was one day I was so excited. And the next day, I was so depressed. Like, I went from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. And, like, sometimes, isn't life kind of like that, right? This episode in my life is kind of like the episodes that we go through in life. There's one day that we're, like, on a super high. We're so happy. And then the next day, we can be, like, on a super low. And our happiness can change sometimes just by the circumstance, right? I mean, my life hadn't changed all that much except for a big wheel. 
and, and no bike, and that was it. But I was so depressed. I was so happy. I was so excited to get that big wheel. All I could do is dream about hanging out with my friends, doing all these stunts, having all this fun, and then all of a sudden the reality set in. I realized that it really wasn't that practical, and at that point I became so unhappy with it I couldn't even stand to look at it. You ever get like one of those places where you're just like, this you just disgust me, you know, <laughs> because it's like, I can't even use it anymore. It's one of those situations. And do you ever notice that sometimes uh, happiness is kind of an elusive thing, right? It's this elusive thing that we're all trying to get to. Uh, some days we feel like we're on top of the world, and other days we wonder, what is the purpose of even living? Do you ever get up like that? I don't even know why I have those days. You just get up and you go, God, you know, I know I love you, but why am I here even here on this earth? Like, <laughs> just take, get rid of my, you know, get me out of here. It's just, you know, nothing even really has changed that much in my life. Just the smallest little bit of news can change my mood sometimes. And, it, and if we were to take a survey here, most of us would put happiness at one of the priorities of our life, wouldn't we? I was on a conversation with a friend the other day, and I'm talking with him, and he's talking about life, life choices that he's trying to make and these options that he wants to do that, you know, just basically going forth from here, what's my life going to look like? And then he said kind of at the end, you know, I don't know if I really care which one as long as I'm happy, right? That, isn't that what we say? Like, as long as I'm happy in life, that'll be good. We want a happy life. We want a happy career. We want a happy marriage. We want a happy family, you know, and, and that's how we judge almost everything in life, how happy we are with it, isn't it? I mean, it's like, that's how we judge our clothes. That's how we judge people. How happy am I with you? And how do we find happiness? Because sometimes happiness can feel like this moving target. And culture is always changing, isn't it? The thing that made you happy yesterday is now changing. And so maybe you're not as happy with it today. The clothes that you bought, your wardrobe, you're looking at your wardrobe and you're like, you know, that used to be in and now no one even wants to see me in that, right? Like you don't even want, you're scared to step out in public with it. Or possessions, the thing that satisfied you at one time is changing. Things are changing so much. We upgrade our phones, we upgrade our cars, we upgrade almost everything and that old thing is now no longer satisfying. You know, Andy here has an amazing house. How many have been to a baptism at his house, right? And we've been there, and Andy's done some great job, like, fixing up that house. It's beautiful. He's transformed the whole thing, because this thing was built in, like, the 80s, I think it was. And so it's like, by now, the people that had moved into it originally, can you imagine when they first moved into this house? They were, like, all excited. Wow, it's a beautiful home, modern technology, you know, all the modern conveniences that we could possibly have. And then 30 years later, we're looking at it thinking, like, this all has to go. Junk it all, right? And in another 20 years, I mean, Andy did a great job, but in another 20 years, somebody's going to be going, like, okay, yeah, yeah, we need to get rid of that, and we need to change this, right? Because things just change. That's the way it is. The problem with happiness is it depends sometimes on our outward surroundings, doesn't it? Like how we feel about something, what's going on around us, the things that are affecting our little corner of the universe, all is, affects how we feel from a day-to-day -day basis. Happiness sometimes is a byproduct of what life brings us. No matter who you are, though, uh, you can have joy because no matter what you're going through, it transcends transcends the things that are happening around us because the Bible instructs us to chase, it doesn't ever ch instruct us to chase after happiness, but it does instruct us to change after, to challenge, excuse me, to chase after something different, something more lasting, and that's called joy. And joy is a state of being. And you can actually have joy in spite of the circumstances that are going on behind, around us. Uh, we're starting this brand new series. I want to tell you what I mean by introducing you to this new series called Triumph, Finding Joy in Every Circumstance. And we're looking at a letter that Paul was writing to this church in Philippi, or it's called, it's called the letter to the, the uh, excuse me, the, the Philippians. Uh, and it was Paul's custom, whenever he went to a new city, to go to the synagogues. Because he would go and try to reach the people of Israel and tell them about this Jesus. Tell them about the next stage in the growth of this religion because they're waiting for the Messiah. So naturally he would go there. But when he gets to Philippi, there is no synagogue. He can't find one. You see, Philippi had been, uh, was a kind of city that had been established about 400 years earlier. And the Greeks had established it. That's why it was called Philippi. And eventually it's renamed after Philip of Macedonia. And that's why he was a Greek conqueror. And his son was Alexander the Great. Right? He set up Alexander to then take over the known world. But then the Romans come in and they defeat uh, the, 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 the Greeks. And, and Octavius, around 30 AD or BC, before Christ, he was the Caesar at that time. He wants to populate the city. They had a war there. He took it over. So he says, all you Roman soldiers just stay right there. And he even asked other citizens to, to join there. And he said, if you'll stay there, but you'll still have the same citizen 
citizenship. You won't have to pay taxes like all the Romans don't have to. And so just stay there. So you can imagine when Paul shows up, it's mostly Romans and some Greeks and very little Jewish people. And so as the custom was, if you went there and there was no synagogue, you would go to the closest body of water. If you didn't have a synagogue and you were a Jewish person at that time, around the time of Christ, or a little bit after, actually, when Paul is there, you would go to a body of water. So he goes outside the city, and there is a river, and there he encounters these women that are praying. One of the women's name is Lydia, and Lydia was a seller of purple clothing, is what it was, and so if you were selling purple clothing, purple was a royal color, and it was not easy to come by, so you were selling to rich people, so she was not too bad off, right? So he begins to share his message with those ladies by the river, and Lydia's like, wow, I love this message, and she brings it home, and her husband and her and her whole family are baptized, and this is the beginning, the inception of the church at Philippi. And then also they get thrown in jail, and then the, you may remember this, Paul's singing in the Roman jail, <laughs> and the doors, and all the doors open, and the jailer at night comes and is like, oh my gosh, you guys, you know, he's worried that they're all escaped, because what would happen if you were in charge of watching a prisoner, and that prisoner escaped, whatever his, uh, whatever his uh, um, sentence was, you would have to fulfill it yourself. So you're very motivated not to let a prisoner escape. So he goes, hey, where are you guys? He's all scared. And Paul's like, hey, just calm down. He and Silas are there together. Just, don't, just relax. And so uh, we're all here. And so he, he bandages him up, and Paul shares the gospel with him, and he becomes saved. And so this is kind of like the beginning of the church in, in Philippi. And uh, so he, it's about 10 years later now, Paul begins to write this letter to Philippi. And apparently they would always provide for Paul's needs by sending him money and gifts when he was in different, uh, when he was on his missionary journeys, being in a new city, he would, they would help support him on his way, even though he also worked as a tent maker to support himself. And so he's writing this letter, kind of like a thank you almost to them in some ways, and he just wants to encourage them. Because many of the letters that Paul wrote, there was actually something wrong going on at that church. And so he wanted to instruct them, he wanted to show them the wisdom of God and direct them in a new way. But here, he has very little instruction, but more it's a way of encouragement. And there are two main themes, by the way, from this letter as he's writing. And the one is joy, and the second one is unity. And so he's telling about these things, and the irony of this letter, okay, that's so known for joy, is that Paul is writing while in prison, right? You would think, Paul, you're in prison. Really, why wouldn't you really just want to tell them a list? Of, you know, they always provide for you. Why don't you just give them a list of stuff that you need? Why don't you bellyache a little bit to them and see if they'll say, oh, poor Paul, let's pray for him more. Instead, Paul starts off with a prayer for them, and he's so excited because Paul right now, he's in Rome, and he's chained between two guards awaiting trial because these Jewish accusers had wanted uh, to prosecute him, and he and he said, listen, take me to Rome. Let me appeal to Caesars because I'm a Roman citizen. And there he's sitting between these two guys. And this is his life. And you would think he'd be depressed. But instead, Paul is very excited and he's filled with joy. And so what we're going to learn about as we study over the next few weeks is Paul's secret to finding joy in every circumstance. But today, we're going to learn how we can cut down on those things that keep us from experiencing joy. Some of the things that actually we do to cause disruption in our own lives. Because what we do often has an effect on our lives. And so we're going to start at the beginning of the letter. Here it is. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and, all, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you uh, all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. For the first day I met you, I think of you fondly, I pray for you, and I'm excited for you, being confident of this very thing. This is the most important part right here, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul starts off this letter with this like, wonderful greeting and this prayer, I'm praying for you guys. And then he quotes this line that many of us have heard before. Have you ever heard this before? That God is going to complete the work that he began in you. And it's this, kind of this encouragement. And the reason he says that, because we all still are growing, right? We're not all where we should be. We're not all where we could be. So the first thing in your outline, if you'll pull it out, 
and you'll follow along. It'll really help the message stick is this. Just fill this in. No matter where you're at, God has not given up working on you. No matter where you're at, God is not giving up on you. Do you know what is one of the biggest factors that brings diversity in my life? It's me. <laughs> it's me. I'm the one who brings some of the most, most of the diversity in my life. I mean, this was interesting. So just Google the phrase, you are your own worst enemy, okay? Do this when you get home. Page after page of article, video, Books will all pop up. Six ways to stop being your own worst enemy. Seven ways to stop self-sabotage. Eight reasons why your worst enemy is yourself. Twelve signs that you are your own worst enemy. I mean, you pick a number, they had a list for it, okay? <laughs> That's how many people are out there experiencing the same thing that I am, and you probably are too. It just goes on and on if you look and Google this, okay? I wish my big wheel decision, okay, was the only bad decision I had ever made in my life, but the truth is I've made worse. Uh, may, many of you know that I grew up in Massachusetts, okay, and I had planned, I didn't plan actually to come here, but it's a long story, and it's a story for, for another time about how I actually got to Florida, but that was delayed by a full year. It was supposed to happen a year before that. It's one of those things I wish I, I said I would never do. Probably you guys have said the same thing, okay? But I'm willing to share this story if you'll keep it just between you and me, okay? Is that an agreement? All right. Well, I was going to church. I was a young Christian, and I met a girl there, okay? A young lady. And this woman, she had two children, and she was going to nursing school. And so she had a limited budget, right? She had school debt. She was still just interning, and she had been raised as a latchkey kid. I don't know if you know what a latchkey kid is, but that means that your parents are not around for you, and that when you come home, you actually have your own key to your house because you're going to return home, and there's not going to be anybody there, and they might come home a little bit later, right? So she's a latchkey kid, so she struggled, and she's still very young, so she's trying to make her way in this world. She's transitioning. She's you know trying to go through school, trying to better her life, and obviously, she kind of got in a little bit of trouble. She's still young and has two kids. And so she's trying to turn her life around, and I was very concerned for her, and, and we were kind of dating, and so I lent her one of my credit cards in case of emergency. I said, I wore, swore I would never do this, right? <laughs> I had known better, right? So I lent her this card, and I thought everything was going well, until one day, as it happens, and this happens, this one day happens every month, a bill shows up in your mail, and I start looking through this bill, and I'm like, wait a minute, this is a really, it was like two to $3,000 on this card. Yes, it's true. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this, this can't be happening. I like drove to her house, like, hey, listen, you're going to have to give me that credit card. This is not going to work out. Like, I just can't, can't do this. And I gave her kind of a little bit of lecture, you know, and I'm like, all right, all right, let's just fix this up. And a couple months went by, and, you know, she's still struggling. And uh, then I did something that I'm even less proud of. I gave her another credit card. <laughs> I really wish this wasn't true, okay? But it's true. This, at the end of the day, cost me somewhere between five and $6,000, okay? Eventually, we got the cards back and everything, and, but it caused me to stay in place for another whole year of work to pay off the debt before I could move forward in my life. My life, because of that decision, was on place was on hold, right, for a whole year because of the decision that I had made. You know, I've made even worse decisions, to be honest. Some I'm not going to share, and so have you, I'm sure, right? If we, Some of you are like, no way, you can't drag me up on there to make me tell my story, right? There are things that we are embarrassed to tell because we made decisions that have either suspended our life, got us into trouble, did little things, whatever it was, that we're embarrassed to tell. And this is the very reason I want you to know that Jesus came, right? Because to save us from ourselves, <laughs> because we've done so many things to save us from our sinful choices that have separated us from God and to keep us from reaping the negative consequences in our lives from the choices that we've made. Jesus came to do that for you and me. It's these negative consequences that we have lived with or that have affected our lives. These are the things that sometimes you and I are still living with. 
because we made a decision, we were hoping it was the right thing, or we just went with whatever we desired at that time, not thinking of the consequences that later came down the road. And when we come to Jesus, he transforms us spiritually. That's what happened. Jesus came, died on a cross, paid for our sins, and then we get transformed spiritually. He says God comes inside of us. Listen to this verse that Paul writes. He says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You've been made brand new inside. You're our new creation, he says. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And so some of us were like, wow, that's exciting. I, I, I've heard that. We don't always feel that. And the reason we don't always feel that, because though we've been born spiritually new, we still live in the old body, don't we? We still live with some of those old consequences, and we have earthly desires, and we have old habits sometimes that die really hard. Paul also wrote this. Check it out. For the flesh, our physical body, the physical part of us, lusts against the spirit. That, that's the thing that's been made new. And it, they fight against each other. And the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Oh, is that what was happening? I didn't realize that. Okay, so God made me new. But then there's still a bunch of junk that we got in our lives. We still haven't been transformed completely in our lives. And so there's this transformation that is beginning to take place. There's this war between our flesh and our spirit. The Holy Spirit inside of us saying, no, no, don't do that. And the flesh going, yes, I really want that though. Right? And that's what we do. And there's this war. I have a guy, he says, you know which one <coughs> wins? The one you feed the most. <laughs> that's just a little extra. Therefore, when we come to Christ, we are not completely transformed. And many of us have realized that, right? And you've seen that in your friends. They come to know Christ, maybe in yourself, and you're like, man, there's been a road that I've been on, whether it's been a short road to knowing Jesus or it's been a long road with Jesus, and you've been seeing yourself transformed slowly over time. And so Paul is writing to them, and he's saying, listen, don't give up, because what God started, he's going to complete. You see, the Holy Spirit is transforming you and me and he's making us more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. This is a process that the Bible calls, and even theologians call, sanctification. It's a process that you and I are in. You see, God knew that everything in your life wasn't going to change. And that part, and we were going to begin changing slowly as God was, as we allowed God into our lives more and more, right? God, let me, you know, let you in this area of my life, but then we hold off some of the other areas, and then slowly we let him into more and more. And then God, when he do, when he do that, when we do that, when we allow him in, he can begin to transform it and begin to change us. And we become more like Christ, and we drop those habits, and we begin to make better choices, and we experience a change in our behavior, and our character begins to change. And ultimately, we begin to experience transformation of our outer fleshly body too. Paul is reminding them that God is not through with them. Because there are times that we all need to be reminded, right? That God is not through with me yet. We are not perfect. And I love that because he starts off with this encouragement. You know, I, I know that there's some things in your lives. You guys are great. You're awesome. And even though I don't really have some bad things to say about you, I know this, that you all struggle. And I want you to know... That God is not through with you yet. God is going to transform you. And he is going to complete the work that he started. I love that. Because when you look at it, and I read that, I'm like, God, I hope you do. <laughs> right? I'm glad that it says I'm going to complete it. Not that I'm keeping you on the right path, but I am going to complete it. You see, we can sometimes want to give up. We can become discouraged. And we can think that things will never change in our life. Or that we're so messed up that maybe God's given up on us. But that's not true. God wants to complete the work in you that he began. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. You see, when life depends on who we are, if life depends on me, then my joy can fade. It's the truth, because I'm going to be looking at the decisions I make. I'm going to look at the times I've messed up, and I'm like, okay, God, it depends on me. It's a mess. But when I realize that my life and my transformation depends on God, then we're going to see things differently. You see, when we're not consistent, we can let ourselves down. We can question how we're doing. But if we realize that God is in control, then the setbacks are not the end. They're part of the process that God wants to do in our life. And what is that process? We're going to continue in the book of, of uh, Philippi, uh, Philippians. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains, 
he's in prison, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. I want you to focus for a minute on that last word, grace. He says, we are partakers of grace. What does that mean? If you're filling out your outline, you write this. Go ahead, put it up on the screen. Do your part and trust God is faithful to do his part. Do your part and trust that God is faithful to do his part. First of all, grace is something that cannot be earned. Okay, You can't earn it. You can't even buy it. Listen to what Paul writes. He says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God. He's referring to the grace. <laughs> it's not of yours. The faith you have, the grace that God has given you, it wasn't even yours to begin with. It's a gift of God. You can't even get it yourself, he says. Not by works so that no one can boast. Paul's saying, listen, you can't earn it. You can't buy it. There's nothing you can do to have it. It's only because of God. Grace is a word <clears throat> sometimes that we fully don't understand. But to understand it, we have to define two other words. And the first is justice. So go to the next slide. Justice. To get what you deserve. That's what it means. And we kind of understand that in our society, right? We want justice. When someone harms another person, we want justice, meaning that there should be some type of retribution. And that means that if there is a certain sentencing or, uh, you know, a certain crime deserves a certain amount, a certain, like, uh, sentencing, like so many days in jail or a certain fine, we want that to happen, because they say that is justice. That is, you get what you deserve. The second thing is mercy. Not to get what you deserve. That's what that means. To not get what you deserve. So in the first one, if it's justice, imagine you're standing before a king and you've wronged somebody and the king says, okay, your sentence is 10 days in the brig and pay back the fine, right? That would be justice. But mercy says, well, you know what? It's okay. You don't have to pay it. You don't, to, to not get what you deserve, you don't get the penalty. That's what mercy is. And we have mercy on other people sometimes when we see homeless people and we say, well, you know, you've earned this, you don't work, you know, you haven't done anything, but I'm going to show you mercy and I'm going to give you money, or I'm going to show you mercy and provide some housing for you, or I'm going to show you mercy and give you food. That's what mercy is when we look onto people and say, okay, I know you deserve something else, but I'm going to show you mercy right now. I'm not going to yell at you the way you yelled at me. I'm not going to re respond with the way someone else responds. That's called mercy. But then this word grace actually means this, to get what you don't deserve. To get what you don't deserve. And that means this, you, not only do you not get what you should deserve when it comes to penalty, but then you get something in return. It's like if you went to the king and he erased your penalty, but then he also did this. Hey, don't go yet. Don't go. Hey, wait, wait, wait. Come here. Come to my house and live with me. That's grace. He pours on to you stuff that you don't even deserve. He's like, this is so amazing. This is what grace is. This is what God is doing in our life. It's what I experienced after my big wheel incident. So my grandmother let me play with the big wheel for a while, okay, for a few weeks, and, and watched me as the crowd, my friends, my group of friends and my brothers all biked away, and there I am all alone, returning back to the garage, just sitting there while they're off having fun. You know, she watched that for a while, and then she's like, okay, she talked to my brother Michael, my older brother, and secretly she took him shopping to pick out a bike for me and surprised me with a brand new yellow bike. And not only that, it was a three-speed. Nobody in my neighbor had a three-speed. My brothers didn't even have a three-speed. I had the best bike of all of them. And that's grace. My grandma was like, yeah, I know you made a bad decision, and you should have to live with it, right? But she was like, you know what? I'm not going to torture you that much. And the grace was, I'm going to get you even better than you could possibly imagine. And that's what grace is. And that's exactly what God does. God takes us. Not only does he not give us what we deserve, which is death, but then he glorifies us. He says, you're going to be like me. He doesn't just save you, but he shares your, his inheritance with you. Listen to what Paul also writes. He says this, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. He says, I'm not just saving you. 
but I'm going to share my inheritance with you. I'm going to share my throne. You're going to be up here with me. I'm going to take it a whole step further. That's grace, and that's what God wants to do to you, and that's why Paul's saying he's going to complete it. I'm not just going to leave you there. I'm going to complete this work in you, and this is why we can trust it's going to be done because grace is nothing to do with us. It's totally dependent on God. It's up to him. And that's why we can't trust our own feelings sometimes when we feel like we've blown it. We tend to judge everything by our own ability, by how we're doing, don't we? It's like, how good am I doing? Is it deserving of something better, right? We judge things on what we think we do or do not deserve. And therefore, if I look at my life, I could think, God, how could you still be working in my life after what I've done? God, how can you even want to continue to use me in the capacity that you want to use me? Because I don't deserve it. You see, he should have given up on me. And maybe you're sitting there thinking he probably should have given up on me too. But instead, we have to trust what God says and accept it. That's called faith. God says, I'm going to do it. This is grace that I'm pouring out on you. And you see, we can believe the statement that Paul made that he is going to complete it because it's not dependent on you and me. And it never will be. It's dependent upon God. All you can do is accept it, do your part, and then trust God. So what is our part? Well, let's continue for a minute. It's for God is my witness. How greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And I pray this, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and discernment. He's like, listen, I will pray this for you, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and discernment that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ Jesus, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He's like, knowledge and discernment. I want this for you because then you can approve of the things that are excellent. You see, good judgment and choices lead to a joyful heart. And when we make better choices, and better judgment, it's going to lead us to the place that we want to be. And so this verse is in the last one on your fill-in. The more you get to know God, knowledge and discernment, the more discernment will increase and the, more, uh, the better your choices will be. This is what happens the closer we get to God. Before we were dating, Carolina's mother invited people to her house for a birthday party for Carolina. Her mom loves to do like big things and surprise people. She has this party for Carol and she gets a list and she always figures out how to get a list of people who should be there. And I think in fact, she called me to get the people that were in the singles group at the church at this time. And so I gave her this list and a bunch of people show it up at her house and I'm there too. But unbeknownst to me, Carolina, maybe I had hints of it. She really liked me a lot. And I guess she had shared this with her mom and her mom knew that she liked me a lot. And so I show up And of course, it's her birthday, so I'm like, okay, I guess I'll get her a birthday gift. Now remember, I grew up in New England, okay? We're in Miami. These are totally different cultures, okay? And this is going to become clear in just a moment. So I get her this gift. I get her, because I had just been recently in New England, and I bought her some maple syrup, pure maple syrup. And it came in this really cool leaf bottle. Check this out. See these like leaf bottles? And I got her like maybe the middle or the medium size one right there. And so I put it, I package it, I give it to her. And so they're opening all the gifts for Carol. And Carol opens up this gift and she holds it up. And immediately, Alba, her mother, grabs it and is like, oh, look at this. Oh my goodness, John, is this? A-? She thought it was perfume. She thought I had spent all this money on perfume. And I'm like thinking, well, you know, maple syrup, pure maple syrup is really cool. But not that cool, right? I'm thinking... But she knows something I don't, right? She knows my wife likes me. And she thinks I like her back now because I got her this expensive gift. And she's like, wow, this is so amazing. Until they found out that it was maple syrup. I don't know if you know this. They don't have maple syrup in Colombia. Not that I know of, right? So they have no clue what it is. And they put Aunt Jemima on their pan- pancakes, so they really don't care. <laughs> and they didn't think it was anything. And then when they found out what it was, they're just like, this guy sucks at giving gifts. 
He's horrible. You know, that's what they're thinking. And I'm like, oh man, I just look like a fool right now. You know, like, that's what I'm thinking. They didn't understand what it was. <laughs> and you know, again, I wasn't going to spend a ton because I didn't, I was, we weren't dating at that time and I didn't want to imply we were dating. So I wasn't going to spend a lot. But I was just like in this weird moment. And you know, this, this moment kind of pops up from time to time. And the thing is, over time, I've got to know my wife better and know what Colombians are, have experienced and what they haven't experienced and know what's a better gift for her right? Because we started dating, and then we've, got, we've been married for a while, and she'll tell me when my gifts aren't that great. And the more I know of her, <laughs> the more I know what she wants and what your character is like and what would make her happy. And it's easy to discern sometimes between bad and good, isn't it? We kind of know if we steal, that's wrong. And we know that if we don't, that's probably good, right? If we hurt people, we know the difference is kind of that. But sometimes it's hard to discern between what's good and what's best. Sometimes that's difficult to understand in our lives. And so we've probably all been there. We were like, well, I don't, this isn't necessarily bad or good, but like, what's, what's better? What would be the better choice? Because sometimes we've made choices that weren't necessarily wrong, but just really didn't bring us to the right place. The big wheel, Right? There was nothing wrong with it per se, but it didn't actually end up bringing me happiness that I thought it would be. You know, sometimes it's hard to distinguish that. But the more knowledge we have, the more discernment we have, the better we'll be at life choices. The more and closer we get to God, that's what he's saying, the more you'll grow in discernment and you'll be able to prove what is excellent. That's what he said. What's excellent? I'll know the difference between what's just okay and what's excellent for my life. And so that happens the more that we get closer to God. We'll know which choices are best. We'll know which are the best priorities in our life. We'll know which are best habits. We'll know, we'll become very familiar what are the best pursuits that we should be living in our lives. And if we're fathers out there, or we're mothers out there, or we're husbands or wives, or we're co-workers or we're friends, all of that will help us grow as we grow closer to God and making better choices, better decisions. And we'll understand better what God has marked off for each one of us. Because God has marked off something for you. That's what Paul was saying right from the beginning. He's saying, listen, I've got, he's going to begin, he's going to complete the work that he began in you. Do you ever wonder what does the end result look like? Because God's got an end result for you. He's got an end picture that maybe you and I haven't seen yet. And the more we get closer to him, the more we get to know him, we get to know his character, we get to know how he would make a decision, and we begin to make those better decisions too. And that's the process of sanctification. That's the process of God completing that work that he began in you and me. What is best? What is that? And why getting closer to God is it better? Because God is the author of life. He knows what's best for you and me. Listen to what Isaiah wrote, or Jesus, he's quoting God. He says, I am your creator. God created you. He says he formed you in your mother's womb. He knew you before you were even born. He says, you were in my care even before you were born. See, God knows you very intimately, and he also knows your end from the beginning. Peter refers to him as the author of life. Paul says that he is the author and perfecter of our faith. The author and the perfecter. I love that he says perfecter. Because you know what? I need a perfecter in my life when it comes to my faith. And you do too. And the closer you get to that author and perfecter, the closer we're going to get to be like him, the more we're going to make better decisions in our life, and then we're going to enjoy our life better. Sometimes we know that joy should be happening in our lives despite our circumstances, don't we? You look on at Paul, and I'm thinking, Paul, you're chained between two guards. You're writing this most amazing letter. It's the most joyful letter that there is in the whole Bible. And yet, sometimes we can fall victim to our own circumstances. Our own choices sometimes make it hard to enjoy life, and they can defeat us and steal our joy. And probably every one of us has been there at one point or another. Each one of us can look back on a thing that we said, on something we bought, and something we did that we knew we shouldn't have done, and then we look back and go, man, I wish I could go back and just change that moment. The more you get to know God's character, his ways will change you. He will begin to transform you so that you don't have to experience those things anymore. This verse is in the book of Proverbs. Solomon wrote this. For the fear 
of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowing God is the beginning of wisdom in our lives. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. The more we know, here's the wisest man who ever walked the earth, and he says, you get to know God, and you're going to begin to make better choices. And at the end of the day, it's all going to be about His grace. You do your part. Start moving closer to Him and watch the transformation happen in your life. And I've seen it in so many people, and it does my heart joys because I don't do anything. I just watch as they continue to grow closer, and they don't do anything except make one choice, draw closer to Him. And then you see these amazing things begin to happen in their lives. It's not about you. Just sit back, trust God, and watch what He's going to do. Let's pray. God, we're so grateful for this word grace. And I don't think we can fully grasp what it means when it comes to the grace that you have for us. Because God, each of us sitting here knows we don't deserve anything. And yet, God, you don't just give us what we don't deserve, the bad things. Man, you lift us higher than we could ever be lifted to sit with you and share in the glory that you have. God, it's something we can't even fathom. Lord, today, help us get on the road that leads to that very place. Lord, you said you want to complete a work in us. Help us to do our part, to trust you, to draw closer to you and help and watch as you transform us. Lord, there are some areas of our lives that we kind of hold on to. And right now, if I can just pray for everyone, Lord, we want to invite you to that place right now. Whatever place that is, Lord, we want to open it up to you and say, God, come in here and begin to transform it. We, we give it to you. I'm, stop, I'm stopping to be the owner in that area. I'm just going to give it to you, God. I open up the door, come into that area of my life and do the work that only you can do. Lord, thank you for hearing our prayer. And as we just remain in attitude of prayer for just a moment, if you've never made the first step, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you've never made that first step of coming to know the Lord, I want to tell you how that happens. As I said earlier, Jesus came to die on a cross. That was God himself in the flesh coming to die on a cross for you and me. What he did was live a perfect life, paid the penalty for all of our sins, he died in our place, and then he substitutes his perfect life for our messed up life. And he says, give me that. Give me that messiness. Give me it all, and I'll trade you. And so then when we let Jesus into our hearts, we receive him as our Savior. God no longer sees our mistakes, but he only sees Jesus. And that's what happens when you invite him inside. That's the first step. That's the beginning of wisdom, that God comes inside, and then he begins to transform your life. And if that's you today, I would just like to lead you in a prayer to invite God into your heart right now. And so I'm going to ask every one of us just to pray this out loud so no one has to pray it alone. Lord God, I open my heart. I invite you inside to be my God, my Savior, and my friend. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. I've decided today to follow you, Jesus, from this day forever. I'm yours. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's just clap.